title of my talk tonight is The Persistence of Slavery in James Buchanan's Pennsylvania. And uh, by the end of it, uh, I hope you understand more about the persistence of slavery than James Buchanan's Pennsylvania, because I kind of just tacked that on for publicity's sake. Uh, we'll stay in Lancaster, we'll talk about Wheatland, we'll talk about James Buchanan, but what we're really talking about here is the history of slavery, black bondage, um, term slavery in the 19th century all the way up into the Civil War era. I'm going to begin with a speech that James Buchanan gave in Washington, D.C. when he was a third term uh, congressman about the subject of slavery. And I need to thank Pat for sharing this document with me. I thank God my lot has been cast in a state where it does not exist. He goes on to talk uh, about how it's certainly a moral evil and it's impossible to escape from it without more evils. Uh, but in 1826, uh, that spring, he declared confidently before his fellow congressmen uh, that he had cast his lot here in Pennsylvania where, where slavery was no more. Let's fast forward some three decades and take a look at another document. So what you're looking at here is the septennial census. I know it says 57, but like the presidency uh, where Buchanan was elected in 56 and, and uh, was inaugurated in 57, the census is from 56. It was just published the next year. That's not really important. What's important is that this was an accounting of Pennsylvania's taxable residents, uh, but it also accounted for several community members with different physical and developmental disabilities in a separate tally. But if we look at the row for Lancaster, there's an asterisk. And that asterisk shows that there was a single enslaved person left in the state in 18. 57. So how do we square these two sources, right? James Buchanan announcing in 1826, I've cast my lot in a state where slavery no longer exists. And this census from his hometown, well, his adopted hometown, uh, on the eve of his presidency, uh, that's what we are going to figure out together tonight. And so I'm going to start by talking about what I'm calling the present state of things. Uh, where is some of the more recent research on, on James Buchanan and slavery uh, and uh, slavery in Pennsylvania during this time period? And then I'm going to move us through a handful of documents uh, to try to make sense of this seeming contradiction. The first will be a court case from 1826. The second will be a piece of legislation from 1847. And then finally, we'll end with an amendment from 1865. You'll never guess which one. Um, but to start, the, the present state of things. So I'm fortunate enough that this is not my first time speaking here at Lancaster History. I first spoke here some four and a half years ago. If you see the date, it was late February 2020, two weeks before the pandemic shut everything down. This was the, the last scholarly thing I did in person for quite some time. And this talk was recorded, like tonight's talk is being recorded. You can access it on Lancaster History's YouTube page, but it was called A Slave for Life If I So Choose, Abolition and Slavery in Lancaster County. And in that talk, I'm not gonna go through all of it, uh, but I hit on a few things that we're going to expand uh, upon tonight. You know, I, I mentioned a certain man named William Morris Meredith, who was a state assemblyman in 1826 when uh, James Buchanan was a, a federal congressman. And when James Buchanan was announcing that there was no slavery in Pennsylvania, uh, Assemblyman Meredith was trying to pass a bill for the abolition of slavery in Pennsylvania at the exact same time period. And this is not where the connections uh, between these two men cease because it was actually William Morris Meredith who sold Wheatland to James Buchanan some 20 years later. I really focused on five myths. That was the framework for that 20 
20 talk. And if you're interested, you can go check out that video online. But tonight, we're going to look at myth number five. I ended my talk uh, last time with myth number five, that Pennsylvania abolished slavery in 1780. And I had some evidence of that. I've since uncovered quite a bit more. And so tonight, we're going to focus on this particular myth in greater detail. But before we get into that, there's one other Lancaster history talk that's important that all of you know about, uh, which is Matt Pinsker's talk from 2021 on Buchanan and slaveholding. If you haven't seen it, if you weren't here, also available online on Lancaster History's YouTube page. You can go and check that out. And Dr. Pinsker, who is a history professor at Dickinson College right across the river, he was focused on, on Buchanan specifically, and he had some really compelling pieces of evidence, some interesting interpretations. He showed these two newspaper advertisements from the Franklin County Repository, showing that James Buchanan's father had owned what he calls indentured uh, black servants, what I call term enslaved black servants, and I'll explain why I make that distinction. This is a place where Dr. Pinsker and I disagree. He also uh, talked about the last will and testament of James Buchanan and the fact that his executors were selling the time of a, a term enslaved young girl. I shouldn't say young girl. She was in her 20s with almost five years to serve. Uh, so Buchanan's father, not James Buchanan, but Buchanan's father had been a part of Pennsylvania's gradual abolition scheme. But really what Dr. Pinsker focused on in his address was this truly remarkable episode in which James Buchanan went to visit an in-law of his in Virginia. And while there, he signed this deed, this legal transaction that transferred ownership of a woman and her child, Daphne and Ann Cook, uh, from his in-law to himself. But before returning from Virginia to Pennsylvania, he manumitted and indentured them. They had been enslaved in Virginia. So they exchanged their Virginia slavery for a temporary servitude, uh, albeit lengthy, here in Pennsylvania. And this was really what, what Dr. Pinsker ruminates on, is to what extent is this involvement in, in slaveholding? Well, it's, it's certainly something distinct from slaveholding as we think of it, right? They were leaving behind slavery for life in Virginia for a much more circums circumscribed form of bondage uh, in the North. Um, Dr. Pinsker found a really breathtaking piece of evidence uh, that furthers this story because uh, once Buchanan and the Cooks returned to Lancaster, tragically, uh, Ann Cook, the girl, passed away shortly after arriving in Pennsylvania. And two weeks later, her mother absconded from James Buchanan's household, ran away herself. And so the question of, of James Buchanan as a slaveholder depends on your definition of slavery. Um, but I'd really like to ask Daphne right, what, what she thought about the situation. Um, so no, he wasn't a slaveholder in the traditional sense, but you should listen to Dr. Pinsker's talk to learn more because I'm not tonight going to be focused on um, the particular relationship between James Buchanan and slavery, but rather what was going on in his home state as he was amassing political power. Uh, so not focusing on Buchanan, there's a great lecture if you're interested in that, but focusing on Pennsylvania. So moving on to an 1826 court case. For each of the three bullet points I gave you, we're going to take a, a circuitous route to get there. I promise we'll get there with each of the three, but let's, let's take our time about it. So going back to 1826, James Buchanan has just made this pronouncement in Washington, D.C. Two weeks later, a woman living here in Lancaster named Maria could do little more than watch as her enslaver registered her son, Charles Sharp, as his property. 
Uh, and in order to understand what we're looking at here, this registration of, of children in 1826, we need to understand Pennsylvania's gradual abolition program. So I'm going to break down exactly how this program worked uh, here in Pennsylvania. So it's true. Pennsylvania was the first U.S. state to pass a gradual abolition law. They do so while the Revolutionary War is still ongoing in uh, late winter, early spring, 1780. It was by no means clear that this law was fated to pass. Uh, it only passes 34 to 21 in favor of abolition. And here in Lancaster County, their representatives voted three to eight against the measure. Now, how did this program work? What does it mean to gradually abolish slavery? Well, anyone born before the Act's passage, so born in February 1780 and earlier, would remain enslaved. But any children they had would become free at the age of 28. Um, right, uh, quite a bit of time. Um, some of the most productive decades of a person's life, uh, certainly their working life in an agricultural society. So, so this was the compromise. And, and I've put an asterisk next to children because the way the law framed exactly who was owed their freedom under this system was a little bit opaque. The language was any child, quote, who would in case this act had not been made, have been born a servant for years or life or a slave. So who can be held in 28 year bondage? Anyone who in case the act had not been made would have been born either a slave for life or owing some kind of lengthy servitude. That's the way the law was written. That's gonna become important in just a few moments. For 50 years, between 1780 and 1830, Pennsylvania enslavers registered some eight to 10,000 people as property. This is uh, individuals who were enslaved when the law passed and their children who have to uh, uh, serve their mothers and slavers for almost 30 years, right? And, and how do I get this, this eight to 10,000 number? Well, I've created a data set of more than 6,300 registrations. Uh, under Pennsylvania's gradual abolition law, enslavers were required to register people they were claiming as slaves for life and their children. It was unique among Northern states for requiring that both parents and children were registered. In most, most other Northern states that follow Pennsylvania in pursuing gradual abolition programs, they only required the registration of the children. So here we have both sets of records, but we don't have them for all counties. And three in particular that really matter are Philadelphia County, York County, and Franklin County. Three counties with significant enslaved and then term enslaved populations. And so I have 6,300 plus registrations. Here in Lancaster, it's more than 1,200 people, right? Both adults and, and their children. And so I'm assuming a few more thousand with Philadelphia, York, and Franklin. That's how I arrived in that eight to 10,000 estimate. Of these 6,300 registrations, 2,300 of them were born after 1780. So are these children that I was describing who, who owed 28 years of labor. So that's the, that's the mechanism by which gradual abolition is going to come to Pennsylvania. Those who are enslaved for life remain so, but their children at some future date on a sliding scale will go free in their late 20s, uh, occasionally in their early 30s. And I wanna zoom in for a second on, on the act itself, an act for the gradual abolition of slavery. And I need to thank Ty Stump, an archivist at the Pennsylvania State Archives for showing me the original engrossed copy of this act because I, I think it has a lot of symbolic meaning, right? When the clerk was writing out the, the statutes, gradual takes up so much space as to have cleaved abolition in half, which for me is always a reminder of, of what, what was lost in this compromise bill, right? Abolition looks a little bit different 
uh, physically on, on the text of the paper itself when preceded by the word gradual. So returning to 1826, right, it's been 46 years since this bill was passed and, and Charles Sharp is being registered by Benjamin Eshelman, an innkeeper here in Lancaster as his property, Maria's son. Uh, those of you with keen eyes might see Benjamin Eshelman and J.B. Eshelman, county commissioner. Uh, I know they're related somehow. I don't know exactly how they are related. There were a lot of Eshelmans in Lancaster in the 18th, and, and still are. I'm hearing some of you. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're, they're still around um, an innkeeper and his public official descendant or, or relative of some kind. Um, there's another part of this that's key, though which is that Maria was not herself enslaved for life. Maria was a servant until she arrives at the age of 28. Maria was not born before 1780, but afterwards. And so Charles Sharp was more than one generation removed from slavery for life, and yet was still being claimed as property in Pennsylvania. These were not isolated incidents. And it was not just innkeepers who were engaged in this practice. If we go back uh, about eight years, we can take a look at another registration. Uh, these records are, are available here at Lancaster History, by the way. So in 1818, Rebecca watched as her daughter, Henrietta, was registered as property. And Rebecca, too, was a servant until the age of 28 years. If I continue reading belonging to the said Robert Coleman Esquire, right? Pennsylvania's first millionaire uh, involved in, uh, you know, partner to the Grubbs iron operation here in South Central Pennsylvania. The registration though, was actually made by Robert's son, Edward, who was an attorney and was about to be elected to the state assembly. So here's someone who theoretically has read law in Pennsylvania and is engaged in this practice all the same of registering multiple generations of uh, black families as property. Uh, for those of you who know uh, Buchanan's history well, uh, you will know that Robert Coleman was the father of, Edward the brother of, uh, and Caroline Coleman, the woman who Buchanan tried to court to tragic end early in his life. There's another remarkable part of, of this registration of Henrietta, which is that it explicitly states when Rebecca, her mother, was registered herself, meaning we can trace this family tree back in time. So if we go back to 1799, well, sure enough, there's Rebecca. She's the daughter of a woman named Dinah, who was, in fact, enslaved for life, born before 1780. Well, who is Dinah? At this point, I can only guess. I cannot say for sure, but I do think it's worth noting that Curtis Grubb, right, the Iron Master, the largest enslaver in Pennsylvania history, uh, at least according to the slave registrations, he registers uh, a woman and her daughter named Dinah uh, in 1780 when the law is initially passed, right? And so if Either one of those Dinahs somehow made their way from the Grubb family to the Coleman family. Uh, it's possible that we're looking at four generations of, of women here who we can uh, put together and, and look at their family tree through these registrations of enslaved and term enslaved persons. But even if these are not the same Dinahs, here's what we can say for sure that a woman named Dinah who was born before 1780 and registered here in Lancaster County. Uh, in 1799, she gave birth to a daughter named Rebecca. And some years later, Rebecca gave birth to her own daughter, Henrietta. All three women were registered as property under Pennsylvania's gradual abolition law. And this is a process that I call in my own work, hereditary term slavery. This is why I disagree with scholars who talk about Pennsylvania's gradual abolition law as creating or, or reverting to forms of indentured servitude. 
In my mind, the hereditary aspects of Pennsylvania's gradual abolition program means that it has more in common with lifetime slavery than it does with indentured servitude, or at least that's the argument that I am trying to make. The fact that here in Pennsylvania, if you were born after 1780 and your mother was enslaved and, and you were a woman, if you had a child before you turned 28, well, that child could be registered as property as well, so on and so forth. At least uh, that's the way it was for quite some time, and we'll get there in just a moment. I'd be remiss if I moved on without pointing out that, that women like Henrietta, women like Rebecca, they're not passive uh, in this, this history. Uh, black women are knowledgeable of the legal system here in Pennsylvania. Some are going to county courthouses to check on their own registration statuses to find out if they were properly registered. And if they weren't, well, they then uh, leave with a note from the county clerk saying that they're essentially a free woman. Um, and the, perhaps the most remarkable and tragic case of resistance to Pennsylvania's term slavery regime that I've come across in my research, I, I only discovered uh, quite recently. And I'd like to thank, and I'm going to transcribe this for all of you in a moment, but I'd like to thank uh, Shanae Bly and Julia Bernier at Washington and Jefferson College, a librarian and an assistant professor working together to help me out for uh, sharing this document with me. Because it shows something truly remarkable, and I'm just going to read it for you. John Hogue, the founder of Washington Town in Western Pennsylvania, has a black woman named Priscilla at his mill in Chartier's Township, who had on the seventh day of May, 1807, a female child born, which he understands she will not name under the impression that it cannot be otherwise recorded. He therefore names it Maria and desires it may be so recorded. Priscilla chose not to name her daughter in the hopes that she might someday have a freedom claim, but Jonathan Hogue forestalled uh, that possibility. But this tells us quite a bit about Priscilla, her, her bravery, her love for her children, and the, the fact that the system of abolition could, could be just as tragic, just as violent, just as heart-wrenching, right, as its southern counterparts. This system of hereditary term slavery doesn't last forever in Pennsylvania. And a story of another woman's bravery is, is part of the way out of this. I think this is the last person I need to thank, but Tom Milholland, director of operations at the Washington County Historical Society, has helped me with some of this research. Um, in 1824, the Washington Abolition Society, uh, and there were others as well, had caught wind of this practice of hereditary term slavery, and they wanted to do something about it. And so this is a, a memoir of William McGurr, who was involved in the Washington Abolition Society. He says that we selected a boy, we chose one, uh, who was the grandson of a slave, right? Second generation term slavery. He obtained permission from his master to come home to see his mother. And we persuaded her not to let her son go back. This sparked a suit in Washington County, Alfred Dwilling versus John Miller, Alfred Dwilling being the name of the boy. We do not know, or I do not yet know, the name of his brave mother who was willing to, uh, who was willing to disobey her son's master in order to try to get this test case in front of a court. Alfred Dwilling versus John Miller is appealed all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And two years later, there's a decision in the case now called Miller against Dwilling. This case holds that the child of a servant until the age of 28 years cannot be held to servitude for the same period and on the same condition as its mother, who was the daughter of a registered slave. And so this is the state Supreme Court decision that does away with hereditary term slavery. And it's also the reason that Pennsylvania's registrations of enslaved people and their children all but die out 
in 1826 because it had been so long that the only folks who were being registered were these multiple generation uh, hereditary term slaves, right? For this to be legal in the 1820s, the youngest possible mother who was born before 1780 would be in her late 40s. And so with this court case, you see the disappearance of the registration of enslaved Pennsylvanians. And uh, essentially, what I argue is the achievement of gradual abolition's promise in Pennsylvania. But it takes until 1826, right? 46 years after the original law is passed. So that's the 1826 court case. Oh, we're doing great, doing great on time. So now let's talk about an 1847 statute. So after Miller, things don't immediately get better for young black Pennsylvanians, at least not all at once. In 1831, there's another court case. This one had its origins right across the river in Cumberland County, uh, Thomas Urey v. Samson Johnston. Samson Johnston was born in Cumberland County in 1800. His mother was term enslaved herself, so born after 1780, meaning that Johnston was another one of these hereditary term enslaved young people. But by the time the Miller decision came around, he was in his mid-20s, right? 26, almost 27 years old. So Samson Johnson sues for damages, arguing that he should have never been held in bondage, that Miller v. Dwilling shows that this was a misreading of the gradual abolition law. And so he argues that he is owed something uh, for all of the labor he performed as an adult. So from the age of 21 to the age of 26 before this decision. And the trial court finds in his favor and awards him $370, a form of, of reparations or restitution. But this also is appealed up to the state Supreme Court, which overturns that case, throws out the damages, and says that hereditary term enslaved people cannot sue for damages in Pennsylvania. There will be no restitution for this system uh, that took root in Pennsylvania. And, and that's why I said that text of the law Right, which, which said anyone who's born after this law is passed who would have been born a slave. It's a self-serving reading of the text to say, well, that means we can register everyone from here on out. Uh, but it's one that attorneys engaged in. It's one that county clerks engaged in. And even in the majority opinion in the Miller decision, uh, the justice who wrote it, William Tillman, said you know, are we, are we supposed to believe that the legislature wanted us to replace slavery for life with a, another form of bondage that would continue forever and ever until the end of the world? And he says, no, that's not what they intended. Um, anyway, I'm getting a bit, a bit distracted. But Samson Johnston did not persevere in the end in an effort to be compensated for this reading of the law. Then there was an 1833 state Senate report, uh, state Senate slavery report. So in 1830, the US federal census did a curious thing, which was showed that the enslaved population of Pennsylvania had doubled in the last 10 years from 200 to 400. Pennsylvanians weren't thrilled about this. And so they organized a commission to study the census to figure out what happened. And what had happened is pretty clear. Individuals who were younger than 50, who therefore could not legally be enslaved for life in Pennsylvania, right? They weren't born before 1780, were being tabulated as enslaved rather than free black. And so this commission concludes that the number of enslaved people in Pennsylvania in 1830 isn't 400, but closer to 60. And this is likely correct. But the question that I have is why did these federal census takers, why were they so confused about the status of these young black people or even these full grown adults who they were encountering in Pennsylvania households? You know, why didn't they know for sure? Uh, or why was it so ambiguous or possible to them that these were individuals who were living in bondage? 
Uh, but the the state Senate report concludes that those numbers are inflated. It's, it's probably most closer, much closer to 60. A few years later, uh, adult black men are disenfranchised in Pennsylvania. They had been voting since Pennsylvania statehood during the, the 1770s. And a state Supreme Court decision and a state constitutional amendment uh, takes this away at the same time in 1838. So yeah, black men had actually been able to vote in Pennsylvania in the early Republic and were not able to do so in the antebellum decades. Um, black Pennsylvanians petitioned against this. Some um, sympathetic white Pennsylvanians did the same. Um, it was actually the most anti-slavery Pennsylvania Supreme Court justice who wrote the majority decision in the disenfranchisement case which is a reminder that being anti-slavery and racially egalitarian are two separate things. Actually, one of his pieces of evidence, he was a justice by the name of John Gibson, John Bannister Gibson. He says that the word freeman in the Constitution couldn't possibly have applied to African-American Pennsylvanians because there was still slavery at the time that the Constitution was passed. So clearly there was a distinction uh, between free white men and free black men. He, he says, it is irrational to believe that the progress of liberal sentiments was so rapid that that's possibly uh, what the white framers of Pennsylvania's constitution could have intended. Uh, you know, another casualty of, of gradual abolition rather than immediate abolition. And then finally, a, a little bit of good news. In 39... Lancaster County uh, residents petition the state assembly for the total abolition of slavery. Uh, and this sets off waves and waves of abolition petitions here in Pennsylvania saying, let's do this for good, right? Term slavery is basically gone because of Miller against Dwilling. But all of those elderly black Pennsylvanians who were born before 1780 are still legally enslaved. So let's do away with the system. Let's, let's get rid of it. And so there are petitions uh, from all across the state, all throughout the 1840s. Oh, the, the, the Lancaster petition. There you go. From 1839, uh, Assemblyman Hare presented a petition from inhabitants of Lancaster County for the entire abolition of slavery in the Commonwealth. So this leads to a bill in 1847. And the bill's called an act to prevent kidnapping, preserve the public peace, prohibit the exercise of certain powers heretofore exercised by judges, justices of the peace, aldermen and jailers in the Commonwealth, and to repeal certain slave laws. So it's very, uh, it's a mouthful, right, that title. For generations now, historians of slavery in the North have pointed to this bill as the moment that Pennsylvania finally abolished slavery for good. Uh, I contend that this was not the case. The problem, as I see it, is that the clerk who compiled the statute book that year referred to section seven of this act in the margins as the abolition of slavery. But what the bill actually did was uh, repealed Pennsylvania law that authorized masters or owners of slaves to bring and retain such slaves within this commonwealth for the period of six months in involuntary servitude or for any period of time whatsoever. So I'll break that down. It had until this point been legal for slaveholders elsewhere to come to Pennsylvania for just a little while with the people they held in bondage, right? This was a compromise to, to Pennsylvania's slaveholding neighbors and slaveholders had six months where they could remain in the state before being considered permanent residents and thus under Pennsylvania's abolition laws. So what this act actually does is repeals the part of Pennsylvania's abolition program that permitted uh, out-of-state enslaver transit. It didn't emancipate the elderly individuals who were enslaved under Pennsylvania law. 
And you figure had it done so, the act would have been named something like an act for the abolition of slavery, uh, but it, it wasn't. Uh, it was fundamentally about, this is a, a good law, by the way. This was about protecting fugitives from slavery uh, who had absconded from the South and found themselves in Pennsylvania. It was basically a law that said, we're not cooperating with slave catchers, but it's not Pennsylvania's abolition law. It was fundamentally concerned more with slavery outside of the Commonwealth's borders than within it. That's the 1847 statute. Then finally, in 1865, amendment. So I showed you the 1856 septennial, but there was an 1849 septennial census as well. So just two years after that 47 statute that doesn't abolish slavery in Pennsylvania. So we'll zoom in once again. These are the returns for Lancaster County specifically. You've got this, this list. That identifies a single enslaved person in the state. And this is one of, of several in Pennsylvania, according to this state document, right? So although the original returns are not extant, state congressional reports reveal that the 1849 septennial identified 13 enslaved people spread over eight Pennsylvania counties from Philly in the east to Crawford in the west. So it was a shrinking institution to be sure, but it was one that state documents recognized, right? Uh, so the state census is saying there are still enslaved people in Pennsylvania. Uh, so another reason why the historians who have said 1847 is this moment of, of total abolition are, I feel, incorrect. There's also the 1850 federal census. Uh, this is a return just across the, the river in York County, um, specifically in York, or sorry, Adams County, York Springs. And it identifies a woman named Patience Sib, who was an 85-year-old black woman, uh, unknown where exactly she was born. But in the final column, the column that says, uh, uh, you know, whether deaf or dumb, blind, insane, idiotic, pauper, or otherwise, so a, a condition, a column for condition, the census taker just wrote slave. So this is the free schedule in for the, for the U.S. 1850 census. There was a separate slave schedule, schedule that was never issued in Pennsylvania, but Patience Sib and two others who were living in Franklin County, their names were the McKellishes, you had federal census takers who wrote the word slave in because they didn't know how else to describe this person's status. So that's the 1850 federal census. We'll return to the 56 septennial um, right, the asterisk shows that there was still an enslaved person in Lancaster County, but thanks to uh, the newspaper, the Lancaster Intelligencer, we can break down the Lancaster County returns a bit further. So do the same thing we've been doing, right? Here are the taxables for 1856. Uh, there's a column for slaves, and we can learn that this person lived in Drummer Township. Right, so now the question is, who was this person, right? One more uh, Buchanan connection before we, we move on. So if you scroll down in the same newspaper, um, first it, it clarifies something about who this Drewmore Township person was. One person is returned from Drumer as a slave who is over 100 years of age and refused accepting his freedom under the manumission law of the state. Now, a few things about that. It was very common during this time period for uh, white observers in particular, um, but for Americans to overestimate the names of elderly African Americans who were unlikely to have birth certificates, baptismal records, things like that, right? So you regularly see estimates that such and such elderly black person is a centenarian, kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. But this is an older uh, black man his freedom, but this second clause, refused accepting his freedom under the manumission law of the state. That's not how it worked. Uh, he, he could not refuse manumission. Manumission had to be granted to him. 
by his enslaver. And, and so here the Lancaster intelligencer gets it a little twisted. And then the Buchanan connection, this is all in the same column of the Lancaster intelligencer from uh, December 56. So just a suggestion now that James Buchanan has been elected president, maybe don't swamp Wheatland every morning as he's preparing for the transition to the White House. Um, all of whom are received with the kindness and cordiality so characteristic of Mr. Buchanan, but in view of the time necessarily required by the president-elect to attend to his immense correspondence, et cetera, et cetera, we respectfully suggest that morning visits before noon, say, should be avoided as much as possible in the future. So Buchanan is getting ready to head down to DC once again, right? And right in his backyard, there's this mystery of this enslaved man in Dreamer Township. I should say that the intelligencer's masthead, uh, once he's elected, is that country is the most prosperous where labor commands the greatest reward on every issue of the intelligencer. So let's talk about uh, some of these laborers. So who was this person from Drummer Township? Well, I'm going to show you a couple of different newspaper articles, and, and, and we'll talk through it together. So here you're looking at the Lancaster Daily Evening Express, and the title of this article is The Last Slave. It is reporting or, or printing reporting from out in Pittsburgh. The Chronicle had been talking about a woman named Judy Williams, who they believed to be the last slave in the state living in Pittsburgh. A reminder, right, that uh, the census doesn't necessarily have everything correct. But the reporters at the Daily Evening Express say the Chronicle is mistaken. There is still a slave living in this county and whose age we are informed is greater than Judy Williams. A little bit, uh, for lack of a better word, gross, right? The interest in the reporting here seems to be with the age of this enslaved person here in Lancaster County, right? The editors of the Express say, shall we record his name as the last living monument of a dark era in the history of Pennsylvania? And this is exactly what they do the following year, which is how we know that that man in Drummer Township was named Abram Kirk. Um, he was maybe a centenarian, maybe not. We don't have his registration records. And there's more confusion here right, when even uh, uh, Lancaster's talking about its own neighbors. In the census of 1850, Kirk was registered as a slave, having been born long before the period fixed upon the emancipation laws of the state, but there was no column for slave in the 1850 census in Pennsylvania. It had to be written in by hand, right? And Abram Kirk is actually identified as a free man in the 1850 census. So which is it? Well, the editors of the newspaper uh, claimed him as enslaved. Judy Williams and Abram Kirk aren't the only Pennsylvanians who appear in what I call last slave obituaries in the late 1850s. There's Patience, who I already talked about from the 1850 census, described uh, upon her death in November of 1858 as the perhaps the only slave then alive in the state. Uh, but no, it would seem that... Charlie McClure up in Lewisburg is another candidate for the last slave in Pennsylvania. And the editors of the Lewisburg Chronicle make this really telling remark. Almost every week, we see notices of the death of the last slave in the state. The next story uh, is a bit harder to read, um, even harder than, than these because we can jump ahead now uh, to the person that I've identified, at least, as the most likely candidate for the last slave in the state. Now, I could be wrong, uh, but here's, here's how I see it. The last slave, Anna Kelly. Uh, I'm going to read from my, my book manuscript uh, what I have about Kelly. Hannah Kelly was supposedly born in Africa in the mid-18th century and trafficked to Virginia when she was just three years old. She was brought to Pittsburgh by the Elliott family, 
who may have registered her with the Westmoreland County Clerk of Courts in 1782. The Elliots eventually sold Kelly to the Gardners, with whom she remained until the mid-19th century, when she moved in with free relatives. But given that Hannah Kelly was enumerated as a lifetime slave as late as 1840, and is not mentioned in the 1853 last will and testament of Elizabeth Gardner, it is plausible that Kelly remained in legal bondage until her tragic death in 1864. Uh, she woke up on New Year's Day in 1864 and tried to warm herself by the fire, and her clothes caught, and she succumbed to the injuries she suffered on New Year's Day a few weeks later. If she was indeed the last lifetime slave, then chattel slavery in Pennsylvania as a legal institution died with her. But the Lewisburg Chronicle merely reports this as another last slave. And if you didn't notice, this is in 1864, right? When Hannah Kelly died, Thaddeus Stevens was already working on drafts of the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery in the United States. And the following year, about one year after Hannah Kelly's tragic end, uh, the U.S. Congress passes the 13th Amendment and it's ratified by the states over the course of 1865, which of course brings us to the 1865 Amendment that I said I would close with. So what do we make of all of this? Well, it's common to talk about slave states and free states. But I try to think of it in my own work as states with a commitment to slavery's destruction and those with a commitment to slavery's expansion. So perhaps freeing states or emancipating states and uh, expanding states. When you think of it in those terms, it becomes a lot easier to understand a place like Pennsylvania, um, which is a freeing state, if not a free state. And I don't mean to suggest that slavery remained a potent institution in 19th century Pennsylvania, because it wasn't. Uh, it was dying certainly by the time that James Buchanan is coming up as a young politician, moving uh, you know, from the House to the Senate into the executive branch and eventually becoming elected president of the United States. But Slavery in James, Can James Buchanan's Pennsylvania persisted, and it persisted uh, perhaps until the very amendment that abolished its legitimacy in the entire country. Thank you. I will gladly take the moment of respite. Testing, testing. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. So if you can raise your hand, I'll come to you. Yep. <laughs> I have a question about uh, <clears throat> George Washington, when he brought his slaves up to Philadelphia in the yeah. 1790s. He, uh, I think, sent some back down within like five months or something, yeah. or something like that. Uh, did he need to do that according to the these laws? So, so yes. Um, the most famous person to run afoul of Pennsylvania's, the six-month sojourner requirement, right, was President George Washington. And the reason he did this is because the Pennsylvania law had a carve out for members of Congress and foreign diplomats, but it didn't name the chief executive. And so even though it was clear that the law was supposed to apply to the federal government operating in Philadelphia, he was left out. And so he did, in fact, cycle people in and out of Philadelphia to serve him at the presidential mansion uh, when that was the capital. And the most famous woman uh, who was part of this process 
was named Ona Judge because she escaped while they were in Philadelphia and made her way uh, deep into New England. So she ran away from the Washingtons uh, during his presidency. There's a wonderful book by Erica Dunbar all about that subject. Um, what interests me is that Washington had actually sent several people that he enslaved in Virginia up to property he had in Fayette County, Pennsylvania, before the law took effect. And so uh, if you look at the, the registrations for Fayette County, you can see places where individuals are saying so-and-so had been the property of General Washington. And uh, when he realized he was not going to be able to get them out of Pennsylvania after 1780, he just sold them. So there's two stories of Washington's involvement with Pennsylvania slavery, the Philadelphia story and the Fayette County one. Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation, by the way. I have two questions. Uh, one is what political bargains, that's my skepticism, what political bargains were made to manage gradual abolition and whose phrasing was that? The second question, why 28 years old rather than say 21? Those are excellent questions and I can answer the second better than the first. Um, the, the best history of the politics of the gradual abolition law remains Gary Nash's and Gene Soderlin's Freedom by Degrees, which you can check out from uh, the research center right here in, in Lancaster history. I shouldn't say check out, look at. Um, there was a good sense by the 1770s that the Pennsylvania Assembly wanted to pass an abolition law. The question was, what could they get away with. And so our, our best sense of what the opposition disliked about the bill comes from a published dissent uh, in the newspapers at the time that the bill was ratified. And they're mostly talking about how, you know, enslaved people are a form of property, that this is a slippery slope uh, to equality, and also Pennsylvania has just joined in a union of newly independent states, all of whom are slaveholding states. And so there's concern about ostracizing fellow members of the new United States Confederacy. So those are the concerns in the way of, of passing this bill. But the language of the preamble, I'm, I'm not going to go all the way back to the slide, but where you saw the bill itself, it starts, no, I've got too many slides to do that, but uh, it, it it has very flowery language about the revolution, the rights of man, about returning to enslaved Pennsylvanians a portion of the rights that independent uh, U.S. Americans enjoy. So it, it was the product of the revolutionary era um, by and large. And the compromises were just, well, what kind of bill is, is feasible? The only other place that had a model really was Vermont, which was not yet a US state. It broke off from part of New York to form its own republic. But in their constitution, they said that no one shall be held as a slave in this republic. I think it's after the age of 28 if male and 25 if female, or maybe it was 25 and 21. But so there was some precedent there for a mechanism of saying, okay, we can't, as a state that respects property rights, do away with slavery all at once without compensating enslaved people. And the future promise of the labor of their children was seen as a form of compensation to enslavers to get rid of the slave system. In the minutes of the Pennsylvania General Assembly, people float 31, people float 21, people float 25, and next thing I know it's 28. I think it was just a back and forth between the pro and anti-slavery factions in the General Assembly. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, the actual transaction? Uh, in the South, there were auctions, but were there auctions in Pennsylvania? Yes. And the evidence for that is sheriff's sales. Every once in a while in a newspaper, you would see that a sheriff 
was going to be auctioning off seized property, and that could include enslaved people. Um, the way that most enslaved and term enslaved Pennsylvanians were moved around was through deed, right, through, through private agreement between two parties, uh, through last wills and testaments, which was a way of distributing enslaved families to slaveholding families. Um, the question of how did enslaved people get into Lancaster before this law was passed during the 18th century, that's still a little bit opaque to me. I know that some were coming from Philadelphia. I know that more were coming up from Maryland and Virginia. There was actually a tax collector in York and Cumberland County whose job it was to assess the Negro duty on enslaved people coming up from the South. So every way uh, that it could happen, it, it did, but there weren't in the Pennsylvania interior large marketplaces like there would have been in Charleston or New Orleans or New York and Philadelphia for that matter during the colonial period. Okay, back here, I have a couple questions I'm asking for our folks from Zoom. Um, so first question, you said that Ernest Grubb was the largest enslaver in Pennsylvania. How many people were enslaved by Ernest Grubb? If you know that off the top of your head. <laughs> so in 1780, uh, Curtis Grubb, I, I'm sorry if I didn't enunciate, right. my fault, registered 25 people in 1780 and i don't have the number for everyone that his estate registered after 1780 so the children right the term enslaved but i believe it was another 17. so 25 made him the largest enslaver in pennsylvania in the records that have survived it's possible there was someone else in york or in philadelphia but i find that unlikely actually um i think Curtis Grubb's wealth, his iron operation, it makes it most likely that that he is the candidate for that uh, ignoble uh, right prize. So, okay, I have quite a few coming through Zoom. <laughs> so, another question: Have you found, or do you know, if other states that utilize gra gradual abolition also had to confront hereditary term enslavement, or is this unique to Pennsylvania? It was most prominent in Pennsylvania. It was not entirely unique to Pennsylvania. There's a scholar, and we can even get uh, international. Um, there's a scholar named Pauline Alberto uh, who wrote an article, and I'm forgetting the journal, but she uncovered uh, something like this in South America. And I, I, I I want to say it was Argentina, but forgive me if I'm, I'm incorrect about that. But there's a, a South America instance of multiple generations of, of term slavery, because this was also the mechanism, gradual abolition, uh, th that took root throughout Latin America in the 19th century. Gradual abolition programs were, were potent. And a scholar named Yesenia Barrigan has written a book on Colombia and maintains a website of all of the different gradual abolition laws throughout the Atlantic world. Within the US, for sure, this was happening in New Jersey, because New Jersey, the last northern state to pass a gradual abolition law, actually has the most in common with Pennsylvania, the first state to pass one, because neither one of them ever got around to total abolition, like New York in 1827, Rhode Island in 1842, and Connecticut in 1848. Uh, I don't believe it happened in New York. It's possible it happened in New England, but it definitely was happening in New Jersey, and it was most prominent in Pennsylvania. Okay, I'll keep going because I got more questions. <laughs> All right. Is there any reason that people who enslaved others during gradual, ab gradual emancipation, parentheses, term slavery, shouldn't be identified as slaveholders in databases, websites, and writings? That is an excellent question that has a lot to do uh, with digital history and best practices in, in archiving. Um. I make a distinction between what I see as term slavery in Pennsylvania and gradual ab abolition programs elsewhere. 
to be, to be frank, I think that term slavery is a useful way of understanding what's going on in the U.S. North during this time period, even if these are individuals who are going to receive their freedom at some future point. Um, the fact that it's heritable in Pennsylvania until 1826 makes me very confident using the language of slavery to understand it better than servitude, but I don't, I don't really have qualms with folks who think it's important to maintain the distinction between lifetime slavery and uh, shorter forms of bondage, right? There's other words we could use, unfreedom, bondage, limited term bondage, and, and retain slavery for the lifetime system. But another reason that I don't mind what I'm doing is because not all individuals throughout the, the South, uh, the places where slavery is expanding, are enslaved for life. There's all kinds of, of statuses throughout the United States. And a, a good example of this is individuals in Southern states who are promised their freedom at a future point in either a deed or a last will and testament. So at the moment that that, that legal document is transacted, they're no longer enslaved for life. Uh, they're still considered slaves and they're actually legal cases throughout the South trying to figure out what to do with individuals like this who have children before they're emancipated. What is the status of a woman who was enslaved, who was promised her freedom in 10 years by deed, and then has a child before that time is up? Different states have different answers to that question, and Lauren Schweninger is appealing for freedom. It's where you can go to learn more about that. Folks, I think that uh, calls it for the night. Uh, thank you all for coming, and let's thank uh, Dr. Young for a great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.